you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yes. I'm Anjale Scott Price. I'm originally from Los Angeles, and I live here in Falmouth now. And I'm on the Falmouth Select Board. And I'm Megan English Braga. I'm from here, and um, I am on the Select Board uh, with Anji as well. And uh, I have a student here at the school. You made it just right in time. You just want to tell us who you are and um, where you go to school. Great, welcome. Nice. This is great. So um, we are going to talk a little bit about public policy today. Um, both of us work on the select board, which is um, you know the body in our town that helps to set policy. And so I think you know we're coming at it from the perspective of how policy is set at the local level. But we're going to do some sort of brainstorming and thinking about how policy is made at, at various levels. So sort of local all the way up to to national policy. Um, and so I guess, should we just start maybe talk yeah. a little bit about what pub public policy is? Yeah. So we work at the local level, as Megan said, um, which is really fun. We get to see a lot of what we do in action. Uh, but we want to talk a little bit about what public policy actually is. So, and also, we don't want to be talking at you the whole time. We want to make this more interactive and want you guys to brainstorm and, and think things with us. So. I'd like to hear what people think public policy is. And don't worry, this isn't this like no a wrong way. thing, because the, the, it's an enormous category. It's a general sort of idea. So what, what do you think of when you hear that word public policy? You can just yell it out. You don't have to raise your hand. It's a good one. Yep, standards. Can anybody think of sort of a specific thing that you would call a policy? Maybe there's one at your school or, or in your community that you can think of? Maybe think about, does your school have any requirements for like a dress code? Okay, that's those, a that would be considered a policy. What kind of policies do you have at your school? My shirt says power to the people. It's an amazing shirt, so. <laughs> but you couldn't wear something like this to school? No, you can't wear things with labels or pictures and stuff on them. Okay. okay. So that's a policy, yeah. right? Okay. Do you, are you supposed to come to school a certain number of days of the year? Okay. That's a policy, right? You have an attendance policy. We have them at schools like this, and then they have some pretty strict ones in, in public schools, right, that you have to attend a certain number of days. School has to be in session a certain number of days mm -hmm. of the year. Um, so policy really is a lot of what you guys are talking about, a lot of what you're describing. So it's really just this idea of regulations, right? Regulations, laws, cases that come out of courts that um, tell us how we're going to do things, right? And it tells us how we're going to do things from really this level that we just talked about, what you can wear to school, all the way up to the most important things, you know, voting, um, you know, your, your rights when it comes to making decisions about your health care. Right? What we're going to talk, one of the biggest things and we're going to talk a little bit about today is sort of housing policy. Okay? And so um, policy really is, I'll just read this because I thought this summarized it really well. It says, public policy is best described as a broad area of government laws, regulations, court decisions, and local ordinances. And government affects all aspects of our lives. Right? And so we all have a stake in public policy. You can hear that word and it sounds sort of far away and maybe not interesting, but it, it determines everything that we get to do on a daily basis. And so um, some of the ways that you can um, help impact policy is through the way you vote, right? At the local level, you can petition your own people at the select board. So someone like Andrea or myself, if you think there's a policy in our town that, that um, you know, needs to be changed, you can do it at the local level, all the way up to when you're voting for a president, right? Because they come in saying they're gonna enact certain policies. Um, and it's really important, I think, to, to note that policies are made by people, right? So they're gonna bring their biases, their own experience, their privilege into making those policies. And that's a little bit what we're gonna talk about today. So I wanna talk a little bit about the, public pol the, the school policy that you brought up about not wearing pictures or whatever. Um, do you know where that policy came from? Do you know who made that policy and why? Um, I don't exactly remember when it came about, but it's been here as long as, I mean, my class has been here. They changed something for people my students now. Okay. Students are not allowed, I thought there was something else, but I don't really know what it was. 
Okay, so without telling that you have to wear something specific, it's just telling you what you can't wear, yes. hopefully to, to make it feel like it's more professional. Okay, so does that kind of policy seem like an equitable policy? I'm getting, I'm getting some no's. Why not? Not everyone has the resources to go and buy things like business has or what kind of. Yep, that's, that's what I was thinking. Any other mm -hmm. ideas? Wow, yeah, that's a good that's a that's a good one. Um, so the reason I bring that up is because a lot of policies on the outside seem like they're really basic policies, like this should be fine for everybody. But when you really dig deep into why some of these policies are put in place, a lot of times it's because people come in with their biases and don't might not think that anybody else doesn't have money to be able to buy different pants or buy different shirts. And so equity is really important lens to look through when you're looking at making public policy. So uh, Megan is on the select board with me. Unfortunately, she's gonna be leaving us. And I'm just very hopeful that the next person that comes in is able to look at the policies that we have in town with an equitable lens the same way that Megan and I try to do when we're looking at policies for the town of Falmouth. And one other thing that, that Angie's point makes me think of is who makes the policy? So do we think that there were students involved? And I don't know, I don't know the answer to this, but in making, if we're just gonna focus on the dress code, do we know how much or if students were consulted when that dress code was first put in place? It wasn't at my school. And our school is very like, a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of the dress code purposes are a lot of females can wear it, and not a lot of men can wear it. Mm -hmm. It's mostly enclosed by like vice versa, and then it's not principal. And our school is really good and we do that as well. Great. So, I mean, this is. This is an example of one of the things you think about when you're looking at it through a lens of equity is not just what the policy is, but who set the policy, right? What did they bring to it? Um, and whose voices were heard when that policy was being crafted? And you know, traditionally, it's a very limited group of voices, right? And so lots of life experiences, um, you know, different points of view are not being part of that, brought in as part of that conversation when we set policy. And again, we're talking about dress code, which you guys live with every day, so it probably does feel really important. In the, the grand scheme of things, maybe it's you know, a little bit lower than when we talk about something like housing or voting. But you can see how every policy um, really confines us, because it's a set of rules, right? So, and it's okay, rules are okay. But um, who sets those rules and how do they impact people? And that's what we're gonna look at a little bit today through the lens of um, housing and housing equity. Um, should I do the little? Yeah, I think so. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to show uh, about a 12-minute video clip, okay? And this is, um, it's going to show you a little bit about a program that was created in Chicago to try and address the issue of housing inequity, okay? So, so this idea that, um, you know, we don't come to the same place. We've, we've lived in this country in, in very segregated ways, racially, right? And so... Uh, and where there are large concentrations of poverty. You know, the way we addressed housing was to sort of put folks who were struggling economically um, all in one area, right? And, and it talks about what some of the problems with that were, and then this solution that was put in place, and we're going to talk about it afterwards. So am I doing it through here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everything's gone to sleep. Oh, yeah, would you just, do you mind? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Perfect. Okay. We didn't have touch screens when I was in school. This is really yeah, cool. Yeah, this is amazing. We did before COVID, everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah. We had, like, the fat back TVs, and we had VCRs. You yeah. guys know what a VCR is? <laughs> I can never tell how old yeah, I am these days. Oh, good. Oh, I'm not that old okay. yet. All right, you're, awesome. you're still okay. I'm still okay. Thank you. All right, let's... 1966, Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders took their fight for equality north to one of the most segregated cities in America, Chicago. 
on mm -hmm. top Cost of their reduction. agenda, improving housing conditions. I'm so sorry. I need to say something real quick. Um, I should make a trigger warning um, before the video continues playing because there is some language in here that, that can be offensive. So I just want to put you. that out there. Yeah. I forgot to say that before we started. Okay. On top of their agenda, improving housing conditions and ending housing discrimination. residents were concentrated in the worst neighborhoods, with the poorest in vast government housing projects. The world of the people who live here bears very little resemblance to the American dream. Valencia Morris and her three daughters would eventually live in one of them. There was garbage, junk on the outside of the buildings. Even in kindergarten, first grade, my daughters would get beat up on the way home from school. They were becoming not violent, but on the defense. She said, listen, Either you're gonna learn how to fight back or you're gonna keep getting beat up. I can't help you. When my mom was starting to see how the environment was beginning to change us, and so she was desperately looking to leave. A group of public housing residents who wanted to live in better neighborhoods with more resources turned to Alex Polikoff, a volunteer lawyer for the ACLU. You had virtually no options. We had some 18,000 public housing apartments built almost exclusively in black neighborhoods. There was pervasive housing discrimination in the private market. Realtors would not show you white neighborhoods. If you got to a white neighborhood, a landlord wouldn't rent you. Yeah. Polakoff filed one of the country's first public housing segregation lawsuits, named Gatron. The suit asked the court to order that public housing be built in white neighborhoods like this one. I was pessimistic about the chances. Everybody knew why the projects were being built in the black neighborhoods, but very few people would say so. This was the way things were. The mere suggestion that residents of these buildings be dispersed has been bitterly resisted by white neighborhoods. Well, it's going to bring down the value of everybody's property. Why do you think that? Because, well, I don't even mm. I just, um, you see those other projects they have, they don't take care of them. But the lawsuit came at a time when the problems and inequality in the inner cities were becoming national priorities. And then, Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. 100 cities rage with riot. 39 die. 20,000 are arrested. Seven days after King's assassination, the government banned racial discrimination in housing. And when the Supreme Court ruled in Polakoff's favor eight years later, the government would have to start providing public housing in white Chicago neighborhoods, including the suburbs. The effect of the case will be far-reaching, even beyond busing, perhaps even changing the structure of America as we know it. One part of the solution was an experiment in integration that had never been tried before, giving vouchers to a few thousand families from the Chicago projects and helping them rent apartments in the suburbs. You had to use your voucher to move to a predominantly white middle class community. And such communities have good schools, they have low crime, they're close to job opportunities. This was a hopeful moment because a new doorway had opened up in terms of how to deal with segregated neighborhoods. The Morrises were one of the first families to move. I immediately called and asked them to put my name on the list. I couldn't believe how beautiful it was, how quiet it was. When I saw the apartments, it was unbelievable because I had never seen a dishwasher before. But life as one of the town's only black families wasn't always easy. I would go out in the morning to get in my car and there would be rotten eggs thrown on the windshield and all over the car. The girls would tell me that people would call them names, would call them nigger, baboon. My mom's advice was, you have to win, period. Keep your head up, keep your mouth shut, and win. My mom would insist that we have the top grades. Whatever we did, she would talk to us as if we were going to succeed. There was so much that we were able to do 
Our high school had a full size professional stage. We had a music program. We had all of the state of the art sports equipment you could ever want. By the time Kaya Morris was a teenager in the 1990s, the media was taking notice of how new neighborhoods could help families succeed. And the Morrises were profiled on national television. Are you glad your mother did what your mother did? Oh, yes. On the American agenda tonight, the power of new surroundings. The control program was designed to promote racial integration, but it is also breaking the welfare cycle. The social science research was startling. Mothers got jobs. Children who went to school went on to college. The residents deserve decent housing. Henry Cisneros, the new Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, hoped programs like the TRO could replace government-owned housing across the country, especially the high-rise projects. It was as segregated as you could define the word segregation in America. Dilapidated buildings, unlivable places, some of them were national stories. Gang snipers and drug dealers, broken elevators, leaky ceilings, and squalid living conditions. And we made people live there. The juxtaposition of that reality in a solution like the TRO made it very clear to me we needed to work at this, precisely at this point. Cisneros promoted a pilot program in five cities. Unlike Gautreau, it was primarily designed to target poverty, not segregation. But it shared the same concept, moving public housing families to wealthier neighborhoods. We're going to provide you help, finding an apartment, getting your children placed in school. Soon, moving families from the projects to the suburbs created another public backlash. Twice this week, parts of East Baltimore County have gathered to try to stop MTO, Move to Opportunity. Let's put a stop to it, folks. The people who would be sent out would be those who needed serious counseling, would need to be taught to take baths and not to steal. And 10 years later, when Lawrence Katz studied the nearly 5,000 families in Moving to Opportunity who did move, the results were disappointing. We're seeing very little in terms of the economic outcomes for the parents and very little in terms of things like test scores um, for the kids. The early success of Chicago's Gautreau program looked like a fluke, and both Gautreau and Moving to Opportunity came to an end. No new families would be moved. The conventional wisdom became mobility doesn't work. Government was not willing to consider it as a policy. By then, the Morris family had already left the suburbs and moved to a middle-class neighborhood in Chicago. I needed to just be around a diverse community. I wasn't necessarily accepted by all of the white friends that I had, and I was too white in some levels for the black kids that had moved into the community since then. She grew up in the suburbs, so as far as knowing African Americans, she didn't really know how we are. So I said, I need to get back into Chicago before she loses her identity. Since then, many of the high-rises have come down, and vouchers have become the largest part of the country's public housing program. But the vouchers often don't come with enough money or assistance to help families live in better neighborhoods. And in many cities, racial and economic segregation remain a problem. All of the other forms of segregation that exist in our society begin with where you live, where you stay, and the effects of that segregation may be harsher than ever. In some places, poverty got even more concentrated. People don't feel that they had full access to what most Americans and what people here would call uh, the American dream. In 2014, Lawrence Katz saw new research on the importance of neighborhoods and decided to find out what happened to the children from moving to opportunity. And now that the youngest children had grown up, he discovered something policymakers hadn't predicted. We're seeing them earning 30% more than a kid who didn't get the opportunity to move to a better neighborhood. We're seeing college going rates increase dramatically. We couldn't see that when the kids weren't old enough. It turned out the program wasn't a failure at all. Neighborhoods and childhood development are long investments and one has to have some patience. Most things that are investments take a while to pay off. I am publisher and editor of the Brooklyn Reader. 
My middle sister, Jamila, is a professor in central Illinois. And in 2014, her youngest sister, Kaya, became the second black woman to be elected to the Vermont legislature. I'm proud and honored to be the first person of color ever to come out of Bennington County. I'm the first black woman to be elected into the House in 25 years. If we were not given this opportunity, would I be here today? There's someone that deserves that chance to have the energy to do the hard work that it takes to get ahead. And you can't do that when you're under the weight and the oppression of poverty. You just cannot. There are a lot of things that I can feel proud about. And I know in the back of my mind that it has nothing to do with me necessarily. It had to do with my circumstances. When my mother gave me the license to start fighting, that was going to probably be my life. I would have been someone completely different. I would have been a big waste of a person. But Kaya Morris says it'll take more than new neighborhoods to create change. In late 2018, she resigned from the Vermont legislature after more than a year of racial harassment by a reported white nationalist. For two years, we lived in my husband's childhood home, feeling unsafe. She says not enough has been done to fight the problems that led to the Gautreaux housing program in the first place. There is no way that we can look at what's happening in our country right now and say that we've dealt with the issues of racism. We didn't do the work in the civil rights movement. That work did not get completed. We never dealt with the underlying racism that established segregation to begin with. Nobody picks where they're born or chooses where they're raised as a child. You play the cards that you're dealt with. I just think it's unfortunate that the cards in our hands are, after 30 years, still unequal. Today, it's the potential economic benefit of new neighborhoods that's getting attention. Lawrence Katz is working with cities trying new experiments in moving public housing families, using detailed data on income and incarceration rates to find the neighborhoods most likely to help children escape poverty. We're losing people who could be innovators, we're losing people who could be artists, and we could have a much more vibrant society if we had less concentration of poverty and social problems. Okay. So I noticed a lot of people taking notes. Does anyone want to share some of the thoughts that they had while watching the video? Yeah. And definitely through your exploitation in the end, where not enough was done in the 60s and during the civil rights movement to address what was the root of the problem. And we sort of just, our government sort of just put a band aid on it instead of really like addressing what the issue was. Yeah. The first part you mentioned about the, the housing and the, um, the property values is something that we're dealing with in Falmouth, is we don't have any affordable housing in Falmouth. And we have what we call NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Those are the people who are like, yeah, that's great, but just don't put it here because of whatever reason. And a lot of their reasoning is because they think it's gonna bring down the value of their properties, which is really unfortunate. But I think also at the root of that, which is part of what you're saying, is that is, is the racist and classist, right? Like, why is it gonna bring down your property values? That's not really gonna happen. That's, that's, we know that that bears out that that's not accurate. We have affordable housing developments in our community that have not impacted um, clearly because our, our median price range of a home in Falmouth right now is over $700,000. That's the median, so it's like right in the middle. Okay, so that is incredible. I mean, that's an, it's an amount that most people will never, ever be able to afford. And that came up almost, I think, two hundred plus thousand dollars during COVID, right? Because a lot of folks came and moved here and it so inflated um, the market. But the reason why people don't want those developments is they'll say things like property value, but those are code words, right? We don't want people who aren't white or we don't want people who aren't affluent 
in our neighborhood. And that's really what, you know, those folks are saying. I mean, I'm not going to attribute it to all of them, but that's really what's at the root of it, because there isn't any truth to that statement that it's going to bring their property values down. Right? And I thought it was very interesting when he asked, why do you think that? And the woman says, well, I don't know. Right. When she got called out. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. I saw Theo, did you have your hand up? No. Any other thoughts or reactions to, to what um, the video was showing? Point out something a little bit different about the video. So I know when I was in school, everything we learned about the civil rights movement and everything we learned about like Martin Luther King was in black and white, which makes it seem like it was a really, really long time ago. ago. It was not that long ago. Um, the people in the 60s, when they were showing the very beginning of the video who were like rioting and really upset, those people are in their 80s now. Those people are likely still around and some people's grandparents. The Morris children who were born in the 80s around when we were born ish. They're like in their mid forties now. They're probably around the age of your parents. And so for me watching this, it really put into perspective that this was not that long ago. Like we literally know people. Exactly, exactly. It's not that long ago. Can you, can you just explain what lo what loving was mm -hmm. so everyone? Sorry. But I think you raise a really good point, which is it, this is why po when we talk about policy, it's a really broad way of doing things. So there are laws, and laws sometimes are really easy to attack because they're clear. They're black and white. They're on paper. And you say, this law is wrong, right? It's, and you take a case, and you, you, you go all the way up to the Supreme Court, and they say it's wrong. There are still policies that go on for decades that still perpetuate that racial segregation or whatever that bias and discrimination is, right? So those housing policies continue to go on, 
right? There are plenty of places where what that individual said, um, you know, is going to, when we moved from our condo in, at Woodrise in 2007, the president of the association wanted to know if the people who bought our house were black, okay? And so those things still go on. And um, those are policies. Sometimes they're written, sometimes they're unspoken policies. And um, so we want to take the last chunk of this for you guys to actually do a little bit of brainstorming around this issue. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a, so and so folks who are even benefit who get the benefit of these programs are still not on the equal footing of the other individuals that they're attending schools, right? They're carrying they're carrying something extra, and that's that's true for there's probably folks in this room who have who have also experienced that, continue to experience that, and it's certainly true in the issue of housing and some of the ways that they've tried to address it. Um, so what we wanted to do was we kind of wanted to get your thoughts, the, you know, your points of view. So we'd love it if you can kind of break into groups of maybe five-ish? Yeah, four, four or five. Four or five. And what we're going to do is we're just going to give you this one little brief sheet, and it just talks a little bit more specifically about sort of housing policy. So the idea of redlining. I mean, there are all kinds of things that they used to do, right? They wouldn't give loans to, to black folks for houses. Um, they, they specifically had sort of geographical areas where they were excluded from. They built highways in between where white folks would live and where they were going to sort of place um, housing projects. So this just gives a really quick summary of some of that. And what we want to do is have you guys generate some thoughts about how can you affect some change in this area of public policy around housing. What are your thoughts about what you can do? Because this is still a live issue. This isn't long ago, it's still happening now. So if you want to break yourselves into groups, and we'll just hand some of these out, does that work? Um, if you have paper, good. If you need paper, we have some here. And then we'll just kind of get back, we'll do it for maybe like seven or eight minutes and get back together and just brainstorm, share it out. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, if we just... 
maybe if we just sort of point out some of the ways that you can affect change here. Like yeah. Select Board, we have an affordable housing committee, the meetings are open, we have not just affordable housing, but we have committees yeah. on lots of things, you know. Yeah. And um, they're, right now they're on, this, on Zoom still. Yeah. And even if not, they're open and you can go.
for really just saying you know, you know, we have really wealthy people and we have people who kind of live in you know cities with manufacturing you know, or just farms. So like after World War II, we really started to kind of create this middle class. Soldiers came home and started to we all be children to help soldiers get home. And they created suburbs. So we can actually look at you know they build these one thousand home suburbs in these places. And those loans were given up by banks that were, but those loans were insured by the federal government. And the federal government perpetuated this idea of red market. This is yeah. not going to be a loan to black and Latino kids in veterans of war. Right? So, so that's not the policy of the past. It's been for many, many decades, officially, and still continues sort of unofficially to this, to this day. Oh, for sure. I didn't learn it in school. I don't even know if I learned it in college. <laughs> I doubt what I did. Yeah, right? Oh, someone's going to talk to us. All right, so we have like one minute. So we're just going to go around. I want each group to just like blurt out something that you think we could do to change this, these policies. So why don't we start, we'll start over here. Like talking about it in schools, like Really loud, Julie. So, so like education, talk about it in schools? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Uh, we were talking about investing. 
So you're talking more like a grassroots sort of changing minds, changing opinions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we also talked about education and like keeping kids A list of resources specific. Oh, here's Sophie. Hey, Charlotte. This session is going to be going to the paper and the apples are going to be back. Yes, I'm also very hungry. But um, <laughs> a, book, a bunch of resources, books like The Color of Law, which actually talks about redlining and how the Federal Housing Administration literally would not give loans to black people, and how that in turn shows how we got to our, um, our wealth gap. It's not the only reason that we have such a wealth gap between different races of people, but it's a really big factor. So this is a, a list of books that I think um, would be age appropriate, and I've read almost all of them, and I can tell you that they are fantastic books. And it's not just about housing. The oh yeah, they're not just about housing. a broad range of all different things, so, and a couple of websites that you can take a look at about and, public policy. And the last thing I want to say is that from all of the towns that you all said you're from, I looked them up, and they all have select boards, which is the level that um, Megan and I are on reach out to your select board members and tell them what you think some good policies are. Tell them your ideas. I'm telling you, if any of you emailed me and said, I'd like to sit down and talk about my ideas, I would love to talk to you because I talk to the same type of people every day, and you know who I'm talking about, and they all have the same ideas, and I would love to hear something different, and I would love to hear from you. And I'm sure in the towns that you're from, if you're not from Falmouth, your board members will want to hear from you as well. And there's also committees. Mm -hmm. So there's committees that each town has, like. Affordable Housing Committee, Coastal Resiliency, uh, Committee Cable. on um, for uh, Substance Use, Committees for Disability, um, let's advocacy. see, Advocacy. I mean, really, almost every subject matter, you know, envir environmentally directed, all of that. Anything that you care about, almost every town, particularly Falmouth, but almost every town is the same, has a committee. And anyone can be on that committee. Okay. And right so, now, a lot of them are on Zoom, so you don't yep. even have to come to them in person. And you don't have to be a member to participate. If you want right. to be a member, to be a voting member, you can do that. But just listen to what they have to say. Put your ideas out there. Um, Our I'll meetings are open. And they're, and they're open. They have to be open. Public meetings are open meeting law. Um, so those are just some ways that you can get involved now, and you can make a make difference in the way that policy happens locally. And then you can also look at ways to do it nationally. Guys, thank you so much. We know we squeezed a lot in. We really appreciate you guys listening and, and sharing some of your thoughts. Thank you. Make sure you grab a Yes, come grab these pieces of paper before you go.